I spend a lot of my life talking about sexuality. The reason for that is that I'm a same-sex attracted Christian. I'm a Christian who believes what the Bible teaches about sex being for the marriage of a man and woman, but I'm somebody myself who the world would define as gay, which means that I'm often talking about sex and sexuality, what they're for, and in particular, trying to explain to people why I'm not sexually active, why I, as a gay man, am not married to another man. In those conversations I have about sexuality with both Christians and unbelievers alike, I found that one of the most helpful discussions to have, one of the most helpful questions to ask, is around this question. What is sexuality for? I found that people who are most grasp where I'm coming from when I get the chance to answer that question. I've also worked out that I most get a chance to grasp where they're coming from when I ask and give them the chance to answer the question, what do you think sexuality is for? So in both uh, sort of conversations with Christians and non-Christians alike, asking that question has been a massive step forward. It's given me an opportunity to explain in a way that they can understand why I live my life as a celibate gay man. And it's given me an opportunity to really appreciate where they're coming from when I've asked them the question, what do you think sexuality is for? What do you think it's all about? Well, in this seminar, I want to pose you the question, what do you think sexuality is for? How would you answer that question? How would you answer that question in a way that would make sense for a secular gay friend? How do you answer that question in a way that would make sense for Christian brothers and sisters? What is sexuality for? Well, let me slightly anticipate uh, the answers that might be buzzing through your mind at this moment. Christians often believe and often articulate the truth that sexuality is for three key things. They're the answers to the question, uh, what is sexuality for, most readily, most instinctively given by Christian believers. Uh, first of all, uh, people who are Christians say, well, well sexuality is for marriage. God has given us the gift of sexual desires and feelings for the opposite sex to draw people into marital union, a sexual union with someone for life. And we see, don't we, the biblical support for this in a passage like Genesis 2, where we see the first marriage. And it is a marriage that comes out of the sexual attraction there appears to be between the first man, Adam, and the first woman, Eve. Let me just remind you of this first wedding, this first example of, as it were, sexuality in action in Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to read Genesis 2, uh, verses 22. Uh, to 25. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. That would seem to be the first, as it were, example of sexuality, sexual feelings and desires in action in the Bible. Adam sees the first woman, he sees Eve, and he is wowed by her. He, he immediately writes, sings a love poem to her, and they get married. The two become one. They are sexually active. They engage in, in sexual intercourse. Sexuality is meant to push a man and a woman together to marry each other. That's one of the key reasons, the key biblical answers to the question, what is sexuality for? Marital union. Adam and Eve, as it were, show as how it's done, what it's meant to lead to. So sexuality is so that men and women get married, so that men and women follow the example of Adam and Eve. That's one of the reasons God has given us these strong, these powerful feelings. But it's not just about marriage. I guess many of us would answer the question, what is sexuality for, with the answer, it's about having children. It's about a couple getting married and having children. It's about a couple, as it were, following the example of Adam and Eve in Genesis 2, so that they can carry out that first commandment God gives his people in Genesis 1. 
Uh, let me remind you what that first uh, commandment is. Genesis 1 verse 28, we read this. God blessed them, it's the first human beings, and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Human beings have been created to recreate, to reproduce themselves. And one of the points of sexuality leading to marriage, leading to sex, is to have children and to be obedient to God's command to fill this world, to reproduce ourselves, to bring new generations in, into this world that can fulfill that command to rule this world well for God. Our sexualities have been given to us by God uh, for, for marital union and for having children. That's another standard answer, isn't it, to the question, probably one of the first that popped up into your mind. Here's the third that I think we, 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 we instinctively come up with. Uh, what are our sexualities for? Whether for marital union, having children, but they're also for giving pleasure. God delights in the joy of sex within the marriage of a man and a woman. The Bible's not embarrassed about a husband and wife enjoying their sexualities, expressing their sexualities in marital union. At the heart of the Bible is a whole book, which at one level is all about the passionate sexual love of a man and a woman. Song of Songs. It, it can be read and it should be read as at one level being about the passionate love God has for his people, the church. But at another level, it is about the passionate love of a man and a woman, of their sexual relationship with each other. And there's no embarrassment in Song of Songs over human sexuality, expressing sexual feelings and desires in the context of a marriage relationship. Uh, when we read Song of Songs, we perhaps get embarrassed by the imagery but, but, and by the language, but God doesn't seem to be embarrassed. Turn to passage upon passage and you see celebrations of sexual passion and sexual love of sexuality. Just to take one example, uh, let's turn, if you've got a Bible with you, to, 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 to Song of Songs, chapter 7, and let me just read verses 10 to 13, just to see sexuality, sexual desires, sexual feelings, uh, as it were articulated in God's word in the Bible. The woman in Song of Songs says, I belong to my beloved and his desire is for me. Come, my beloved, let us go to the countryside. Let us spend the night in the villages. Let us go early to the vineyards to see if the vines have budded, if their blossoms have opened, and if the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. The mandrakes send out their fragrances, and our door is every delicacy, both new and old, that I have stored up for you, my beloved. The woman there is preparing, is proposing a walk in the countryside with a lover. But it's not just the nature walk. They're not just going there to admire the flowers. No, she's inviting him to make love with her, to have sex with her out in the countryside, to consummate their love for each other in nature. And that is just a reminder that when it comes to the Bible, one of the, that the answers to the question, what is sexuality for, is for a man and a woman within the covenant relationship of a marriage to enjoy giving pleasure to each other. That is one of the reasons we, you, I, have a sexuality. Marital union, having children, giving pleasure. Those are the three answers I think most quickly probably come to our minds. Those are the answers I'm sort of guessing you thought of just a few months ago when I posed you the question. But I want you to think now about, about the limits to those answers. I want you to think in particular of of how those answers leave someone like me, who is same-sex attracted, who is gay, and so who is not going to be getting married, not going to be having children, not enjoying sexual pleasure in the context of a marriage. If my sexuality is for those, those three things, and I'm not going to, as it were, get the chance to do those three things, what is the point of my sexuality? To, to put it another way, think of the student that once said to me this, 
why can't God just zap us with sexual feelings, with sexual desires, with a sexuality on our wedding day when we get to use it? Why does he have to give us these feelings, which many of us have to live with for years, for decades, potentially the whole of our life, and never get to express sexually? The students who asked me that question, who, who posed me that challenge, went on to say, it made him question God's goodness, the fact that God has given us such powerful feelings, such important feelings, and then said to many people, just don't express them. Don't go there at all. They're a present, they're a gift that you're never to open. You're to keep under wraps, you keep to repress at all times. Now that sort of challenge from a student I was seeking to disciple was quite a profound challenge. If, if sexuality is just about marriage and children and, and pleasure within marriage, what is the point of God giving me a sexuality, you a sexuality, if you're single? What is God trying to do through sexuality? Is, is it just those three things? Or are there more reasons God has made us? as sexual beings, that God has given us all of sexuality that are actually open to all of us, that bring benefits to all of us. And it's sort of thinking like that and, and puzzling over that that has made me realise that there are two other great big reasons why God has given as all of sexuality that are beneficial, that are good news for all of us, whatever our marital status, whether or not we're sexually active, whether or not we're gay or straight or whatever we might label our sexuality. There are two reasons why God has given us sexuality as the gift of sexuality that are good news for all of us. And the first reason is this. God has given, I think, you and me uh, sexuality, sexual desires and feelings to help us appreciate the full, the full passion and the pain that comes from his love for us. God has given us sexuality to help us appreciate, to grasp, to feel the full passion and pain of his love for us. Let me explain. It, when I was really puzzling through these things, I was very near a place of, of beginning to think that my sexual desires and feelings were, were a curse something that I couldn't express, I couldn't, as it were, use in a relationship with another man because of God's word, and so something that just seemed to create guilt and, and shame in my life. Then I read, I happened in God's goodness to read a book by the American pastor John Piper. The book's called Sex and the Supremacy of God, and two sentences within it transformed my life, made me think about sexuality in a much deeper and bigger and more helpful way. Listen what, in, what, into what he says in, in Sex and the Supremacy of God, uh, page 26. There he writes, the ultimate reason, not the only one, why we are sexual is to make God more deeply knowable. The language and imagery of sexuality are the most graphic and most powerful that the Bible uses to describe the relationship between God and his people, both positively when we're faithful and negatively when we're not. What's John Piper saying here? Well, John Piper is making the case that in the Bible, one of the, the most powerful ways God communicates the full passion of his love for us, one of the most powerful ways the Bible communicates the full pain we cause God when, when we walk away from him, the way that God most, as it were, powerfully does that is through using the language of sexuality through, as it were, communicating to us and connecting with our sexual desires. Where does this happen, you might be thinking. Well, think for a moment of a Bible passage like Ezekiel 16, where God uh, compares himself to a lover, a male lover, who is attracted to a woman representing uh, God's people, who is drawn to her, who, who is attracted by her, who marries her, who consummates his relationship with her, who enjoys her beauty. All of that to, as it were, help us grasp his love for his people. 
to sit where feel that love because we have felt similar love in our lives here on earth. And then, of course, as Ezekiel chapter 16 goes on, what does God do where he communicates what it's like for us to walk out on him, what it's like for us to wander away from him, what it's like for us to be idolatrous as he portrays God's people as an adulterous wife who sleeps with anybody and everybody, leaving her husband in pain, leaving her husband humiliated, leaving her husband alone. God communicates the passion of his love for us, the pain of his love for his people, using sexual imagery, using the context of a sexual relationship, communicating with the deep sexual feelings we all have, communicating with the passion and pain we feel in the area of sexuality to help us feel his love, his pain. Just getting that was transformative for me in realising that though I might never express my sexuality in a sexual relationship, my sexual feelings and desires and the passion that they bring into my life and the pain that they bring into my life are helpful for me to grasp the passion, the pain of God's love for me. And so rather seeing my sexuality as a curse, as something that God's given me and just told me not to use, I began to see it as something that God has graciously given to me to help me to grasp, to feel, to know his love for me. One of the reasons we have a sexuality, one of the chief reasons God has given us the gift of sexual feelings and desires is according to the Bible, according to passages like Ezekiel, 16 whole bible books like hosea and song of songs it's all about communicating god's love for us we're to look at sexual passion and desires and the full immensity and intensity of them and we're to cross refer to god himself and grasp the wonders of his love for us but sexuality is not just about appreciating god and his love for us that's not the the only deeper that's not the only more powerful reason we've been created as, as sexual beings. There's another. God's given us the gift of sex and sexuality. God's given us the gift of marriage in particular to, to also trail the destination of his people, to help us in this current creation get where this world is heading and to give us a foretaste, a trailer of the new creation the new world in which God's son Jesus will marry God's people, the church, forever. What is sexuality for? What is sex for? What is marriage for? It's to help us see where this world is heading. Just think back to the Bible. Think, think back to the Bible and how it begins with a wedding, you know, Genesis 2, but also how it ends with a wedding. Revelation 19, Revelation uh, 21, 22. The Bible is the story of God's love for his people. It will end with God's marriage to his people. And every marriage that there has been between a man and a woman from Genesis through to Revelation is meant to be a little trailer, a little foretaste, a little pointer to where this world is heading, to, to what this world is all about, to what human history is all about. The romance that will end with a wedding of God's son Jesus and God's people the church when, when you go to a Christian wedding when you see the bride walk down the aisle to get married to her husband the bridegroom waiting for her at the end smiling her willing her on down you're being given as it were a, an acted out demonstration of human history of the Christian story, of the gospel, of how God in Christ is going to marry his people, of how human history is just the walk down the aisle to the moment when God's people will be united to God's son forever, when we will enjoy the most loving and intimate and perfect and most beautiful relationship of all, united united to God's son Jesus forever. When I go to a wedding, there's a great danger of me as a single person, me as a same-sex tracks or gay person, thinking this has got nothing to do with me. This is not something I'm going to enjoy. This is not something I'm going to experience. 
God's story, the Bible tells me that that's the things are wrong. No, this is something that I am going to enjoy. This is something I am going to experience. The wedding I'm part of is just a trailer. I am going to experience what it's really pointing to, the real thing. One day I, as part of God's people, will get married to God's son. We'll enjoy a perfect union, the most perfect of all unions with God's son, Jesus, forever. So my longing to get married and to be united with somebody else is, is not a wasted longing. It's not an unsatisfied desire. No, it's a longing that points me, that points all of us forward to the one who will truly complete us, Jesus himself. What is sexuality for? That's the question we started with. Well, in the Christian universe, it's about marriage and it's about kids and it's about the joy of sex. Yes, but it's also about the gospel. It's also about God's love for us in Christ, the full passion of that. It's also about the, the story of the universe, where it's heading to the great wedding. And, and we need to be communicating that much better. We need to be asking that question, what is sexuality for? And we need to be answering it in much deeper and richer ways. We need to be pointing out how it is all about the gospel, how it is all pointing forward to him. And we need to use that as a discipleship opportunity and also an evangelistic opportunity. We need to help people see that the reason Christians are, are very different in what we say about sex and marriage and that Christians are, are opposing same sex and marriage, not because of some small little reason in some obscure verse in the Old Testament, but because of the big picture story of the Bible as a whole, because of the gospel story as a whole, because in the marriage and the union difference between a man and a woman, you are getting the gospel acted out. And when you change that, it goes wrong. Let me explain how all this big picture theology helps us, helps us in our Christian living and in our sharing of the gospel. Um, let's, as it were, just grasp how all of this helps us live with some of the things we, we perhaps most struggle to live with as Christians uh, today. Let, let's think, first of all, about how all of this helps you, helps me live with sexual difference and understand and grasp why sexual difference in marriage is a non-negotiable. We sometimes struggle, don't we, to, to see and to feel why marriage, why Christian marriage has to be between a man and a woman, why it can't be between two men and two women. And we struggle because in our world today, marriage is just defined as two people who love each other wanting to express their commitment to each other forever. When within the Christian worldview, it's about two people who are different to each other, wanting to express their love for each other, wanting to serve each other, but also wanting to live out the gospel, point people to the gospel through their marriage, through the mystery of marriage to, to be an advert for God's love for his people, to point people to him. Really interesting, isn't it, that in the Christian worldview, marriage and the gospel story and the relationship between Christ and the church are, are, are totally bound up with each other. To the point that Paul, when he's teaching about marriage, cannot help but also teach about the church and its relationship with Christ, because in his mindset, in the biblical worldview, marriage and the gospel story um, are all part of the same thing. Let's turn to see this for ourselves, tick to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, where we see Paul uh, teaching about, about marriage, giving advice to men and women about what marriage is. And as ever, Paul is being clear and logical, and we're following the argument well about the need for uh, the man in the marriage to be like Jesus, the woman in the marriage to be like uh, Christ's uh, people. And, uh, and we're probably thinking this is classic Paul, uh, beautifully teaching about the, the implications of the gospel uh, for an area of Christian living for marriage. But then towards the end of the chapter, he seems to get himself in a little bit of an unpauline muddle. Because one moment he seems to be talking about the marriage of a man and a woman, and then the next moment he seems to be talking about the relationship between Christ and the church. And we can find ourselves thinking, come on, Paul, stick to one subject. 
don't get yourself in a muddle. Don't, don't go off on a red herring. And if you've ever thought that, as you've, as you've read Ephesians 5, as you've, as it were, tried to follow the logic of what Paul's saying, of what he's teaching the Ephesian Christians. Let me read a, a couple of verses where he seems to be getting in a bit of a muddle. Look down at Ephesians 5, verses 31 and 32. Paul writes, quoting from uh, Genesis uh, chapter two, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. When you read those verses in, in context, you think, Paul, what are you talking about? Are you talking about marriage or are you talking about Christ and the church? And, and if he was here, he would say, no, I'm talking about both. Because whenever you talk about marriage, the union and difference between a man and a woman, you are in Christian theology, in the Bible story, talking about marriage, uh, talking about Christ and the church, because that's what marriage and creation between a man and a woman is in creation to represent the eternal union of Christ and the church. And so the reason why Christians cannot accept same sex union, same sex marriage is that it's changing something that is not just a contract between two parties. No, it's actually a, an acting out of the gospel, a bit of symbolism, rich Christian symbolism, almost something sacramental in which what is happening points us to something deeper and far more significant. And in the same way that we're not at liberty to change the symbolism of baptism, in the same way that we're not at liberty to change the symbolism of the Lord's Supper, we're not at liberty to change the symbolism of marriage, the union difference between Christ and the church, between a man and a woman. C.S. Lewis is, is really interesting on this, writing decades ago um, about, uh, about Christian priests in the church, men and women both becoming priests, but actually writing something that's far more relevant to discussions around same-sex marriage today. He says this in his, in his essay, Priestesses and the Church. The kind of equality that implies that equals are interchangeable, like counters or identical machines, is among humans a legal fiction. It may be a useful fiction, but in the church, we turn our back on fictions. One of the ends for which sex was created was to symbolise to us the hidden things of God. One of the functions of human marriage is express the nature of the union between Christ and the church. We have no authority to take the living and seminal figures which God has painted on the canvas of our nature and shift them about as if they were mere, mere geometrical figures. We're not at liberty, says C.S. Lewis backed by Paul, backed by the Bible story, to take a man and a woman and the concept of Christian marriage and make it a man and a man or a woman and a woman. Because doing so is changing something that God has given us to point us forward to the union and difference between Christ and the church. Turns out sexual difference matters in marriage. It matters in sexual relationships because one of the points of them is to point us forward to the union and difference this world will end with, to the great marriage, the marriage between Christ and his church, the marriage that is beautifully described in Revelations 19, at 21 and 22. And so though at one level, I would love to get married uh, to another man. I, I love that to be a possibility for Christians. It isn't a possibility for Christians. Because marriage is not something we designed and we get to change because we know what it's about. No, it's something that God's designed and he gets to shape because he, know what, he knows what it's really about. And he tells us in scripture, he tells us in Ephesians 5, it's most of all about the union difference between Christ and the church. So you're beginning to see how answering this question what is sexuality for? How seeing the big picture reasons is really helpful. It's really helpful for us to understand and potentially also to justify to the world around us why union indifference matters in Christian marriage. Christian marriage is not just two people in love. 
making a commitment to each other. No, Christian marriage is a bit of religious symbolism, a bit of Christian symbolism. It's about enacting the gospel story. It can't be changed because that would change the gospel story, the whole Christian message. And that's not something we're at liberty to do. But how does all this big picture stuff help us in other things too? How does how does knowing what sexuality is for, the purpose of it, how does that help us cope with our experience of sexual attraction in the here and now? Well, I think it helps us to recognise that sexual attraction um, is good in and of itself. There's, there's sometimes, we've got to be careful in, in how we put this and understand this, that sometimes uh, Christians see sexual attraction as, as all bad. And there's an extent to which the Bible teaches us that, that every instinct and thought and deed and action from every human being is infected by sin and is bad. We'll be clear on that. We'll be clear on what Romans teaches us about human sin, how pervasive it is. There is no one righteous, not even one. There has never been a, a pure sexual human act since after the fall. But at the same time, I think it's important for us to understand that, that sexual attraction has at its root good desires, good desires for beauty and for completion, a good desire and instinct that we're not complete in ourselves, that we need to be, that we, we long to be united to someone who will perfect us. Those are good desires. Those are good desires that come from the fact we're created in God's image and other people are God's image bearers, and we have been wired to appreciate God and to worship God, and we find it very easy as a result to appreciate beauty in other people and to worship beauty in other people because who does it remind us of god and it's just important for us to recognize how at the heart of a lot of sexual attraction is a recognition of beauty a recognition of beauty that has been designed to point us to the source of all beauty god himself now if we ask a quite basic question you know why do i find other people attractive why do any of us find other people attractive? Whether they're talking about sexual attraction or just any other forms of attraction, why does that happen? Well, Genesis 1 verse 27 is where I would go to explain that the reason I find other people attractive, their personality, their looks, any number of things, is because I'm seeing the image of God in them, in the beauty of their looks, in the beauty of their character, in the beauty of their deeds. What am I seeing? The beauty of their creator, God himself. And therefore, when I'm attracted to another human being, when I find them attractive, I've got a chance. I, I, I'm experiencing what, what I call a call to worship. Beauty should, if it's used in my heart and mind as it's intended, it should lead me to worship God himself because he's the person that scattered beauty all over our creation in, in landscapes, in art in people, in actions. And seeing beauty in any of those ways is a call to worship him. Now, the problem is so often when I see beauty in another person, when I'm attracted to them, when I'm attracted to them sexually, it becomes a call to worship them, the creature rather than the creator. And I need to repent of that. But I need to also start using those moments of attraction, those moments of being drawn to somebody, those moments of sexual attraction to instead of descending into lust and a desire to consume them, use it as an opportunity to think, yes, they are beautiful. Praise God for the beauty that he has given that person. And as it were, lead, let that noticing their beauty lead me into praise and worship of the creator rather than the creature. Sexual attraction can be good in itself. It, it can be something in my life that leads me to God. Often it's been something that's led me away from him, but it can be correctly used, something that causes me to worship him more. And understanding what sexuality is for, understanding how my sexual feelings can draw me to worship of him has been a really helpful thing for me and hopefully for you too. How does all this help us also live with, with sexual pleasure? If you're married and you're enjoying sex, how does 
all of this big picture uh, thinking around what is sexuality for? How does it help you process sexual pleasure? Well, it, it helps you realize that it's just a foretaste of what it's of the real thing. If you're enjoying sex within marriage, think how much better what it's pointing forward to be the, the full consummation, the union in difference of the church and Christ himself will be even better than the joy of sex in the here and now. And if you're someone that's not enjoying sex within marriage at the moment or isn't married and is and not in a sexual relationship, has never been in a sexual relationship, will never be in a sexual relationship. All of this helps because it it reminds us that we're just missing out on the foretaste. We're just missing out on the trailer. If you're a Christian listening in to me talking at you today. What you need to know, what you need to grasp, what you need to realize is that. All Christians will, in the end, get married. All Christians will uh, experience what marriage points to. All Christians will experience what sex is just a foretaste of. The great union difference between Christ and the church, which will be better than any sexual act here, which will be more enjoyable, more permanent, more ecstatic than anything anyone has ever experienced here. Which means I don't need to worry about missing out on sex in the here and now. I don't need to feel that I'm not fully human to miss out on sex in the here and now. No, my longing for sex in the here and now should point me to what will truly satisfy that longing. Not sex in the here and now, but a union with Christ. Um, the consummation of all things, of all of God's people in a relationship with Jesus forever. The final thing I think all of this talk of what sexuality is for helps us with it is sexual temptation itself. I don't know if you've ever been sort of, well, just discouraged by how this area of our lives can be so difficult and so tough and so painful. And I don't know if you've ever sort of pondered why is it discussions around sexuality and same-sex marriage that is dividing churches and denominations and bringing about so much hurt and conflict in so many different places. Why is that? Well, think yourself, if I can put it like this, think of yourself into the devil's shoes. If marriage and sex within marriage are so important to the gospel story, if getting marriage and sex right so that it can be a good trailer of the new creation is so important, if sexual difference within marriage is so key for us understanding the whole sweep of the Bible and the whole content of the gospel, of course it's going to be an area in which the evil one is attacking individual Christians and the church again and again and again because it matters so much. So we shouldn't be surprised that the New Testament is, is so eager for us to avoid and flee sexual immorality. Because the writers of the New Testament know that this is an area where maximum impact, damage can be caused. Individual Christians, uh, Christian churches, the witness of Christians. Destroy a Christian understanding of marriage and you're destroying one of the great pictures God gives us in creation. God gives us in his word to point us to the passion of his love for his people, to point us to where this world is heading, to point us to how good it will be to be married to Jesus forever. Of course, the evil one wants to attack Christians again and again. Of course, it's going to feel like hand-to-hand -hand conflict so often with him because it matters so much. And this is an area in which he wants to destroy Christian witness yeah, because he wants to destroy the Christian church. Well, I said a lot. I've posed you the question, what is sexuality for? We thought about some standard answers, marital union, having children, giving pleasure. We thought about some, some deeper, some more profound answers that, that work perhaps better for more people and help us to see that marriage and sex are primarily about the gospel, primarily about appreciating God's love, that the, the, the passion of his love, the pain of his love for his people, of how uh, marriage and sex trail the new creation in the current one and we've seen haven't we how that helps us how that helps us live with sexual difference and explain sexual difference to a watching world how it helps us uh, live with sexual attraction and see the goodness and not just be negative about it in our own lives and as we talk about it with unbelievers uh, we, we've helped see how 
this helps us live either with sexual pleasure if we're enjoying sex or with the absence of sex. And that is a message we can take to the world around us because so many people are living lives without sex and nobody else is helping them to do that. And all of this has helped us make sense of sexual temptation, of why this is a massive area of conflict, of why so many people have caused so much damage and hurt in this area because it matters so much, because it's so significant in the Christian story. We need to be having more and more conversations within Christians, circles, within churches and with the outside world about the purpose of sex. We need to be asking ourselves and we need to be asking other people, what do you think sex is for? What do you think sexuality is all about? What do you think marriage is? When it comes to evangelism, we are so good, aren't we, at delivering lectures and sometimes not good enough at just asking those sort of questions that will help us appreciate the differences between a Christian worldview and a secular worldview, but also give us wonderful opportunities to talk about God and his love for his people to talk about where this world is heading, to offer hope for those who have been sexually damaged, to offer the prospect of true everlasting intimacy for all of us who crave that more than anything else. What is sexuality for? What is sex for? What are marriage for? Questions we sometimes fear being asked. Questions actually we should be asking ourselves and others more and more.